As a child, what did you want to be or do when you grew up? I'm interested in hearing your thoughts in in just a moment. Um, I may have mentioned it to you before, but I wanted to be a garbologist. Um, I'm old enough to remember, believe it or not, I'm old enough to remember the the friendly garbo that used to ride on the back of garbage trucks in Brisbane. Jumping off the trucks, jogging around the back of the house, collecting up the metal bin, tossing its contents in the back of the truck and carrying it on their way. We used to put out goodies on top of the garbage bin lid at Christmas time um, to thank the garbologist for their work throughout the year. I used to think, what a life. Outside, physically fit, finished work by lunchtime and receiving unexpected gifts at Christmas. You know, these little bonuses on top of bin lids. What about you? As a child, what did you want to do or be when you were older? If you're listening on the podcast, then I'd love to read your responses on our Facebook um, page. So, have a think about it. What did you want to be or do when you were um, growing up as a child? I'll race around with the microphone. Anyone want to pop up their hand? Yep, Helen. Oh. When I was young, I wanted to be a ballet dancer. Mm-hmm. And I danced all my life. And when I got to grade six, Miss Durack said to me, because I wasn't a very good student at school. Yep. I couldn't spell much. I couldn't add up. However, she called me up on the, the front of the grade that year and said, Miss Boynton, would you like to tell the rest of the class what you would like to do when you grow up? I said, oh, yes, miss, I'd like to be a dancer on the stage. So we've got to learn to spell and add up. And I said, well, I don't think, miss, when I'm dancing, they're going to know if I can spell or not. Oh, I got in trouble. <laughs> but I did. <laughs> yep. I really got into trouble saying that. But I did dance, and I ended up dancing with a ballet company when I grew up. Wow, there you go. Fantastic. <laughs> what about others? Um, what did you want to, when you were a child, what did you want to do when you were older? Yep. To be a nurse. Mm-hmm. I wasn't allowed to go and study and the quarters were the middle left just to get away from mum and dad. Okay. Yep. That didn't happen either. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to be a nurse. Okay. Anyone else want to chime in with what they wanted to do when they grew up? You'll give it a go? Okay, John. I think what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I think this was the dream of many young boys, wanted to be a policeman. Mm. But my wife said to me, as soon as you spoke about it, I wanted to be Superman. Yep. And I'm still dreaming about Superman. So (laughs) how about that? Maybe my (laughs) dreams are coming true. All right. Well, as long as you don't start wearing the underpants on the outside of the long johns, that's fine, you know. So, Okay. Thanks so much for that. Really appreciate uh, you giving us a little bit of an insight, whether it be dancing, nursing, or just plain old Superman. That's great. Simon, um, who Jesus renamed Peter, was a professional fisherman. He and his brother Andrew were probably at least second-generation fishermen. They hung out with James and John, Zebedee boy, uh, Zebedee's boys, who were also professional fishermen. Years earlier, they would have regularly joined in the synagogue school, uh, learning the sacred scriptures, while the synagogue leaders and local rabbi picked some of the synagogue boys to become followers of the rabbi. Simon Peter, Andrew, James and John, they didn't make the cut. Maybe it was because they couldn't spell well enough or whatever else it might have been. Um, They were not good enough. They didn't have the potential to be the disciple, the follower of a rabbi. That probably didn't come as too much of a surprise to them or their parents, so they learnt the family business of fishing. For Simon, business was generally good. It was hard work, but it was honest work. And it supported Simon Peter um, and his wife. Um, But there was also competition in the fishing game. 
So you had to know your stuff. Understanding the moon phases, the behaviours of the fish, seeing the signs on the surface of the water, knowing how to attract the fish, the spots of where you should cast your nets. You also had to know the Sea of Galilee, the lowest freshwater lake on earth, 21 kilometres long, 13 kilometres wide, with hills to the east, which contributed to violent storms as the, over the sea as the wind direction changed, bringing cool winds across the warmer lake. The Sea of Galilee also sits above the major Dead Sea Transform fault line, where the land on the east side moves south and the land on the north side moves north, with earthquakes felt as recent as 2018. But even with a lifetime of experience in fishing and generational experience passed down from Father the Son, there was no guarantee of success when you went out on the boat. Those who didn't know their stuff would soon go out of business. Peter and Andrew and their mates, James and John, they knew their stuff. James and John ran a small fishing business which also employed others. In the reading from Amy, that uh, Amy brought to us this morning, as she read from John chapter 1, verses 35 and following, we discover that Luke 5, the, the passage that we're going to look at today, was not the first time that Jesus, the travelling rabbi and carpenter, had met Simon Peter, Andrew, James and John. John the baptizer had pointed Jesus out to others, declaring that Jesus was the Messiah, the Lamb of God. Simon Peter, his family and friends, had also seen Jesus heal Simon's mother-in-law. Amazing stuff for this Messiah. But as you are probably aware, it's one thing to know, it's another thing to believe. So if you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to, with me to Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. As we discover another snapshot in the life of Jesus and how Simon Peter becomes a fearless follower of Jesus. It was an ordinary day and the rabbi Jesus was back in town. On the shore are Simon Peter, his brother Andrew, and just along the shore a little bit further were James and John. After a long night of fishing, well, more so wetting their nets, moving from historical good spots to the less reliable places, rowing and sailing what felt like from one end of the Sea of Galilee to the other, with the sun rising behind the distant mountains in the east, it was time to head back to shore. After a long night's work, you just want to get home, have a feed, and then collapse into bed and dream of better days. But there's always the clean-up, that, that really niggly thing that you have to do before you're really finished. That frustration, but ne uh, the necessity of the task of checking the nets, undoing any snags and washing them, getting them ready for the next night. With the backdrop of the Sea of Galilee behind Jesus, and the sun on his back warming his shoulders. Jesus begins engaging passerbyers as he, a carpenter from Nazareth, in the hills to the west, that way, west, yep, um, the hills to the west, um, he starts teaching about Yahweh God. Now, there's no synagogue audience here, just frustrated birds complaining about a lack of fish and fishermen looking forward to getting home. Those who did have success that night sold their catch to passers-by. The smell of the water and the breeze over the lake diluted the smell of fishing boats. This was before the days of sard wonder soap to deal with the blood and guts and grease off the rod. So let's pick up the story in Luke chapter 5, verse 1. 
Luke chapter 5, verse 1, we read these words. One day as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats on the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, he asked Simon, its owner, to push it out into the water. So he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. The Son of God enters our world taking on flesh and blood. And rather than being held up in a synagogue all the time, Jesus continues to incarnate himself, fleshing himself out further, moving into the hustle and bustle of everyday life, going where the people were. There Jesus calls people's attention to God. Jesus was a charismatic, engaging speaker that caught the people's attention. Maybe he started with a joke. So there's a rabbi, a Pharisee and a scribe and they're on their way to the temple. And the rabbi says, well, maybe not. But whatever Jesus does, he captures the the average person's attention beautifully connecting them like a talented busker on Burke Street. The crowd starts to press in and a crowd draws a crowd. People are captured by Jesus and the crowd flows down to the shore, to the water's edge, and Jesus needs to adjust his delivery method. Simon, I need your help, mate. Jesus sits in the boat, the teaching position of authority, the posture of a rabbi. Simon Peter knows his craft inside out. Instinctively, he responds to the breath of wind on the side of the boat that could easily have Jesus drift down the shoreline or find himself with his back to the previously captured audience. Tired shoulders and legs are attuned and respond. It's like the oars and the boat are an extension of Simon's body. All the while, Simon Peter is captivated by Rabbi Jesus. Verse 4 says, Now when Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it's deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let down, um, let the nets down again. Bailey, Kenneth Bailey, puts it something like this. Listen, teacher, boss, my boys and I are professionals. We know where the fish feed and the best time to catch them is at night. That's why we were out last night, not now. We're not stupid. We have just worked the fishing areas hard and we've caught nothing. And we are now dead tired. We've stayed away a few more hours to serve you. You rabbis think you know everything. You order me to fish during the day in deep water. You have Nazareth sawdust in your veins. I have the um, the sea in my veins. But very well, let's go out and let's see who knows what about fishing. So Peter and his brother Andrew head out, away from any chance of the hiding fish around the rocky shores. With a shake of uh, the head in derision, the nets are cast into the water, and they sink beneath the surface out of sight. Then comes the pull of retrieval, with their empty hall vindicating these professional fishermen, and a valuable lesson will be taught to this upstarty rabbi to mind his own business. Well, that was until verse 6. And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish on the verge of sinking. The adrenaline has Simon Peter um, spending money from the catch before they've even reached the shore. You could fish your whole life and never catch, have a catch like this. They have hit 
the fishing jackpot. Just a few more like this and they will be set for life. Move out of your way, out of the way, Rex Hunt. Jesus, the fish whisperer, is here. But then reality sets in for Simon. Away from the onlooking crowds and those who know him best, the stark difference between Simon Peter and Jesus was there for all to see. This is the first time Luke uses the term sinner. Verse 8. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, O oh Lord, please leave me. I am too much of a sinner to be around you. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught and the others with him. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. Simon Peter, Andrew, James and John experienced amazement and fear. The Greek word pulls those two concepts together as they grappled with what had just happened. They knew fishing back to front. And these sorts of things just don't happen. But Jesus seeks to bring peace and calm to their fears, but also desires to transform their lives. Simon, in the past, your catch has ended up dead as dinner. Now, I'm going to teach you how to catch people alive, to bring them to life. So after three years of hanging around Jesus and learning from the Master, how do you reckon Peter went? Well, Acts chapter 2 gives us a wonderful concept of that. Peter steps forward and addresses the crowd and his words captures them alive. In verse 41 we read, Those who believed what Peter said were baptised and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. For Peter, spending time with Jesus turned him into being a fearless follower of Jesus. Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. For us today, we can easily be like Simon Peter. Our whole life set before us. We can see our future in this line of work or doing this in retirement. For Samantha, a few years ago, your life was headed in a particular direction, working with the ACT Council of Social Services in Canberra as the capability manager, actively involved in ministry there at ACTOS, and also a pretty unique faith community. Greg, you were working in Canberra, enjoying life and discovering love. But then Jesus comes along and calls you to fearlessly follow Jesus to Melbourne. Use the gifts, the talents, the abilities that you have. Just as you faithfully served in Canberra, fearlessly follow Jesus to Darabin. Leave your nets. Leave, and leave even possibly a bumper catch, as it were. Nothing about the last season was wrong. But now the time is right for the next chapter. And I wonder for others here today, have you worked hard? You've worked hard and you've earned a rest. But then Jesus calls and calls you by name to fearlessly follow him into the next chapter of life. Maybe you've landed a cracker of a job, a role that you've been dreaming on, maybe even Superman. You have a significant win. But Jesus is asking you to put him first. Maybe you've retired from work, but that doesn't mean you've retired from following Jesus. Perhaps life has, been, uh, has thrown you a curveball and you're wondering what the future holds for you. William Temple, in his book Nature, Man and God, wrote this. The spiritually minded person does not differ from the materially minded person, chiefly in thinking about different things. 
but in thinking about the same things differently. Maybe Jesus is calling you to look at what you do differently. Today, just as Jesus did 2,000 years ago, Jesus is still looking for people to fearlessly follow him. Will you follow Jesus? Let me pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for the difference that you can make in people's lives, whether it be 2,000 years ago or today. We thank you for what you are doing and will continue to do in the life of Northern through your people placed here as we seek to live transformed lives by the power of the gospel at work in us, that we might be known as a people who fearlessly follow you. Jesus, would you continue to move and work in our lives? Holy Spirit, would you brood amongst us, empower, equip and anoint us at whatever age we find ourselves at to be a fearless follower of you in the conversations that we have, in the actions that we take, because we believe you are at work in our midst. Amen. So how might we respond today? Well, there's a couple of questions that, or thoughts that I've got on the screen there. When you think of the focus of your life at the moment, what role comes to mind? What is the most predominant one, the thing that comes first to your mind? Ask Jesus, ask God to help you to see that role through his eyes as you fearlessly follow Jesus. Is there change on the horizon for you? Then ask Jesus to help you to fearlessly follow him into that future, as uncertain as it might be. And is there fear that is holding you back right now? Ask the Holy Spirit to help you conquer your fears as you step out in faith to fearlessly follow Jesus. There's an opportunity for you to respond. You can pull out those response cards and maybe one of those kind of resonates a little bit more with you than others. Feel free to respond to that. Um, there's going to be some music played and after the music's played, we'll invite the team to come on up, lead us in our final song where those offerings and the response cards and pencils will be collected. God bless you.